namo bhagavate vasudevaya janma yasya yato nivyad itaratas chate suavigyaswara janma yasya yatam vayar itaratas chate suavigyaswara tene brahma yudaya adhika vaye muyatiya suraya tene brahma yudaya adhika vaye mujantija suraya tejo varimedam yata vinimayo yatra trisargomisha tejo varimrita jata vinimayo jatra trisargomisha amna svina sada nirasta kuhakam satyam param dimahi Dhamna Svina Sada Nirasta Kuhakam Satyam Param Dimahi O my Lord Shri Krishna, son of Vasudeva O oh, my Lord Shri Krishna, son of Vasudeva O oh, all-pervading personality of Godhead O oh, all-pervading personality of Godhead Offer my respectful obeisances unto you Offer my respectful obeisances unto you I meditate upon Lord Shri Krishna because he is the absolute truth I meditate upon Lord Krishna because he is the absolute truth And the primeval cause of all causes and the primeval cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universe. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. The relig original living being. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and the demigods are placed into illusion. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representation. As one is bewildered by the illusory representation. Of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Of the water seen on fire, land seen on water. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations in the As one as one is bewildered by the illusory representation of the material world. Uh, therefore, I meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna. Therefore, I meditate upon uh, Who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode. Who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode. Which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. Which is forever free from the illusory representation of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. I meditate upon him for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Projita Kaitravutra. Dharma Projita Kaitravutra. Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam. Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam. Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu. Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu. Shivadam Tapa Trayon Munam. Shivadam Tapu Trayonanam. Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Kute. Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Kute. Kim Va Parer Ishwarha. Kim Va Parer Ishwarha. Sadur Hidi Avarudhyatetra. Sadur Rudhi Avarudhyatetra. Kriti Bihi Sususubis Takshanat. Kriti Bihi Sususubis Takshanat. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. The highest truth is the reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold mysteries. Such truth uprooted the threefold mysteries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. It's a beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. It's sufficient in itself for God realization. It's sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, as one, one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. By this culture of knowledge. By this culture of knowledge. The Supreme Lord is established within his heart. The Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpataror galitam phalam. Sukamakad amrita drabya samyutam. Sukamakad amrita drabya samyutam. Pibata bhagavatam rasam alayam. Pibata bhagavatam rasam alayam. Muhur ahoraska bhuvibhavuka. Muhur ahoraska bhuvibhavuka. O expert and thoughtful men, relish Shimad Bhagavatam. O expert and thoughtful men, relish Shimad Bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire to read Vedic literatures. The mature fruit of the desire to read Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Even though its nectar and juice was already relishable for all. 
I mean, all these next things is already sure for all. Including liberated souls. Shinvatam Swakata Krishna. Punya Shravana Kirtana. Punya Shravana Kirtana. Vidunati Suhitsatam. To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures. Or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita. It's itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Oh, yes, Lord, Krishna. Lord Krishna is dwelling in everyone's heart. Acts as a best wishing friend. Acts as a best wishing and friend. purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. And purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta praesha bhadrishu. Nityam bhagavata sevaya. Nityam bhagavata sevaya. Bhagavati uttama sloke. Bhagavati uttama sloke. Bhakti bhavati naistiki. Bhakti bhavati naistiki. In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. And this way, is what we naturally develop is dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam. As he hears more about Krishna from Bhagavatam. And from the devotees. And from the he devotees. He becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. becomes fixed in his devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tamo bhava. Tadarajas tamo bhava. Kamaloba dayaschaye. Kamaloba dayaschaye. Chaita itair anavidam. Chaita itair anavidam. Sitvam sattve prasiddhati. Sitvam sattve by development of devotional service, by development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. One becomes free from the mode of passion and ignorance, and thus material lusts and avarice are diminished. And thus material lusts and avarice are diminished. Evam prasanna manaso. Evam prasanna manaso. Bhagavat bhakti yoga taha. Bhagavat bhakti yoga taha. Bhagavat tattva vijnanam. Bhagavat tattva vijnanam. Mukta sangha sijayate. Mukta sangha sijayate. When these impurities are wiped away. When these impurities are wiped away. The candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. The candidate remains steady. Becomes enlivened by devotional service. Become enlivened by devotional service. And understands the science of God perfectly. And understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis. Chidyante sarvasamsaya. Vidyante sarvasamsaya. Siyante chasyakarmani. Drista evat manishwari. Thus bhakti yoga severs the hard knot of material affection. And enables one to uh, and, and enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram. Understanding of the supreme absolute truth personality of Godhead. Understanding the supreme absolute truth personality of Godhead. Therefore, only by hearing from Krishna. Therefore, only by hearing from Krishna. Or from his devotee in Krishna consciousness. And from his devotees in Krishna consciousness. Can one understand the science of Krishna? Can one understand the science of Krishna? Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 17, Verse Number 15. Anagatsviha Bhutesu. Anagatsviha Bhutesu. Ya Agatskrin. Nirankusha. Ya agas krin nirankusha. Ahartas me bujam shakshad. Ahartas me bujam shakshad. Amart yasyapi sangadam. Amart yasyapi sangadam. Translation by Srila Prabhupada. An upstart living being who commits offenses by torturing those who are offenseless, shall be directly uprooted by me, even though he be a denizen of heaven with armor and decorations. Purport by his divine grace. The denizens of the heavenly kingdom are called Amara, or deathless, due to their possessing a long span of life far greater than that of the human beings. For a human being who has only a maximum 100 years duration of life, 
a span of life spreading over millions of years is certainly considered to be deathless. For example, from the Bhagavad Gita we learn that on the Brahma Loka planet, the duration of one day is calculated to be 4,300,000 times 1,000 solar years. Similarly, in other heavenly planets, one day is calculated to be six months of this planet. And, they have, and, the, and the inhabitants get a life of 10 million of their years. Therefore, in, the, in all higher planets, since the span of life is far greater than that of human being, the denizens are called deathless by imagination, although actually no one within the material universe is deathless. Maharaja Pariksha challenges even such denizens of heaven if they torture the offenseless. This means that the state executive head must be as strong as Maharaj Parishit so that he may be determined to punish the strongest offenders. It should be the principle of a state executive head that, offender, that the offender of the codes of God is always punished. punished. Sila Prabhupada Ki So it's very good that Prabhupada explains why sometimes people think that being transferred to the heavenly planets means they're immortal. They're not immortal. But they have a very long duration of life. And it may seem immortal in relation to people to, uh, on the earth. So Prabhupada says, everything in the material world is relative. And what does that mean? That means that in the highest sense, Krishna is absolute and everything in the material world related to Krishna is related to Krishna but is relative. Uh, relative means it depends on something else. Right? Now, the scientists who reject the existence of the spiritual world, reject that Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they say everything is relative. Well, because they only know what's in the material world. So they say uh, the earth, uh, existence on the earth is relative to existence on higher planets. However, they do not actually follow that principle. What do I mean? Well, they say that there's no life on other planets, at least they haven't discovered it yet. And why do they say that? Because they're trying to impose the conditions on the Earth and assume that the same conditions must exist on other planets in order for there to be life, even though they believe in the law of relativity. So this means when they go to the moon, if they did go to the moon, but let's assume they did, although they didn't, they say, oh, well, there's no, no uh, living beings on the moon because uh, we didn't see any. And, uh, and, and if for, them, for us to, uh, to accept that there are, they have to look like us, they have to have an atmosphere like that of the earth to breathe the air, and they have to, uh, have a body made of earth, water, fire, air, and ether. So although they say everything is relative, they impose the conditions on the earth on all the other planets in order to, to uh, say there is life or not life. And that is false because everything is relative in the material world. So therefore, the conditions on the earth do not dictate the conditions of life on other planets. So when you go to a place like the sun, you will not see people with uh, the same type of body composition as on the earth. And when you go to a place like the moon, you will not see people with the men bodily composition as on the earth. They, in, in every place there is also, there's always gonna be the f five fundamental elements or the Mahabhutas, the earth, water, fire, air, and ether. However, the uh, percentage of these are different on other planets. 
Therefore, when they go there, they don't see anybody. They say, ah, oh, there's nobody here. But actually, there are. So on the, on the sun planet, first of all, you can't even go there because you would burn with this kind of body that we have. But let's say they go there with a spaceship, or with a spacesuit that is inflammable, that, that cannot burn. So they would look around, they wouldn't see, they say, there's nobody here. But yet, the people on the sun have a different composition of their body than the people on the earth. Their body is mostly made of fire with very little water, earth, and but there is air and, uh, and ether. So therefore, you don't see them, but yet they're there, right? Because they're Im trying to impose the, the earthly body conditions on uh, wherever they go to to say that there's there are or aren't people there, so although they accept the principle of relativity in the material world, they don't uh, follow it, and therefore they remain in ignorance when they go to these other planets if they go. So this is an interesting point, uh, and in the same way, uh, a uh, there are certain insects that only live at uh, for one night but in that period they're born they grow they stay they give off byproducts or they, they they reproduce and then their body dwindles and then they die in in a in a less than well let's say a 12 hour period they have a full life and for us to have a full life we can live at most up to 100 years or a little bit more, or most people live less. And at that time, we're born, we grow, we stay, we produce byproducts, we dwindle, and we die. So we experience that, that, that little uh, animal or that little living entity that only lives for 12 hours at night experiences uh, a full life just as we do in 100 years, they do in, in 12 hours. And when you go to a place like uh, Brahma Loka or you go Indra Loka, they live much longer than we do, but they experience it like we do. And they have, they also, they're, they're born, they grow, they stay, they give off byproducts, they dwindle and they die. So their experience of 100 years is, uh, well, our experience of 100 years, they also experience their uh, millions of years, but in the same way we experience the 100 years, in the same way the, that little insect experiences 12 hours as a full lifetime, you see? That's the real sense of relativity. Okay, so therefore he says that a lifespan spreading over millions of years is certainly considered to be deathless, but that's in comparison to the earth, right? For example, from the Bhagavad Gita, we learned that on the Brahma Loka planet, the duration of one day is calculated to be 4,300,000 times 1,000 solar years. That would be 4 trillion years instead of 4 million years. Similarly, in other heavenly planets, one day is calculated to be six months of this planet, and the inhabitants get a life of 10 million of their years. Therefore, in all higher planets, since the span of life is far greater than that of the human being, the denizens are called deathless by imagination, although actually no one within the material universe is deathless. That's an interesting point he makes. He uses this language, deathless by imagination. He doesn't mean deathless in reality. So Maharaj Pariksit challenges even such denizens of heaven if they torture the offenseless. In other words, Maharaj Pariksit being an ideal king, he won't tolerate unnecessary uh, pain given to cows anywhere, whether on the pla heavenly planets or the demoniac planets or on the earth planet. This means that the state executive head must be as strong 
as Maharaj breaks it, so that he may be determined to punish the strongest offenders. It should be the principle of a state executive head that the offender of the codes of God is always punished. Well, this is for the stability of society. But when you have weak leaders, like Gandhi was a weak leader. He was strong in, in, in the sense of being dedicated to uh, nonviolence, but you can't be a politician and be nonviolent. Because why? Look, Maharaj Pariksit is a pure devotee, he's much greater than Gandhi, but he was violent when it was necessary. Right? And to the point where he would even go to heavenly planets and punish people if necessary. Nobody should hurt a cow in any situation. So, uh, you cannot have a stable society when you have cowards as leaders. On the other hand, they cannot be uh, demoniac. They cannot enjoy uh, seeing people suffer. The, the devotee always follows the principle of para upakar, always doing good to others. So, he's only going to be extremely let's say, proactive with serious offenders of uh, the laws of, of Dharma. Uh, but he has to have courage. Like, for example, when, when uh, the Pandavas were living incognito and uh, the uh, Kurus uh, uh, attacked the kingdom of Virat. And they were on the outskirts ready to, to enter into the kingdom. And news came to King Virat, and Virat's son said, I'll go there and fight with them. You know? So Arjuna said, okay, well, I'll be your chariot driver. I'll, I'll, I'll help you if I can. Right? So on the way, uh, Arjuna gets his weapons that were hidden. And because he has to fight a whole army. He's not fighting one person. He's fighting an entire Kuru army uh, with all the Maharatis. And uh, when they approach uh, the line of battle, the son of Virat faints out of fear when he sees <laughs> this huge army, all these Maharati fighters. He just faints. You know, it's, it's unconscious, you know. And during that time, Arjuna defeats them defeats the whole Kuru army, which is unbelievable how he did it. And later when the boy uh, gets, comes to consciousness, he actually came back to consciousness during the fight and then immediately he went, he passed out again. It was so frightening. But finally he realizes this guy was a servant in their house. He's not some ordinary person. And he realizes that he's Arjuna himself. You know, I mean, People had heard about them, but they had never seen them probably. But now he realizes who he is. And when he goes back, he tells his father and tells everyone, this person is Arjuna. He defeated the whole uh, Kuru army by himself. And uh, so you see, when you have a strong leader, they have to not be afraid. Now, Virat's son was a Kshatriya, right? But uh, there are different levels, just like there are different levels of gurus, there's different levels of Kshatriyas, there's different levels all the time. And uh, the boy, when he saw such an impenetrable and, and uh, overwhelming uh, force, he fainted, right? And that happens a lot. If, if someone is not trained to be a fighter and they're put into a serious situation, they, they they can pass out out of fear, or they'll run away. Just like as a, as a joke, the, the Italian army has tanks with one gear to go forward and 10 years gears in the tank to go backwards. <laughs> <laughs> the Italian army has always been famous for uh, losing battles, you know, <laughs> at least in modern times. So, you know, you can't be like that. You have to be, you know, just like when, uh, Guru Granth Sahib, I mean, I'm sorry, when uh, uh, the 10th uh, uh, Guru of the Sikhs, 
uh, Guru Govinda, uh, he, uh, he created what's called the Khalsa. The Khalsa were supposed to be sadhu, look like and live like sadhus and be celebrate, not get married. They can't have a family. Because you have a family, it's hard to go out and battle. right? Because you're thinking of your wife and your kids. So they had to be celebrate. They had to live like brahmacharis, but they were trained to be killers. Fierce killers, determined to either win or die. Right? So he, he produced the Khalsa. How did he do that? Uh, one day, he called a big meeting of all the Sikhs in Punjab. And he said, uh, who is willing to come and willing to die for our people? So out of thousands of people that were there, men, only five men came forward. And he said, okay, follow me into a tent. You know, he takes them into a tent. And in the tent he had some uh, uh, sheep also. So he slaughters the sheep and comes out with blood on his sword and blood all over the place and with five heads. Uh, but, you know, there, there was such a big crowd they couldn't exactly see clearly what it was. But he came back and said, these are the heads of the people I just killed. They were, they were real soldiers. Now, who else is willing to be a real soldier? People were shocked, right? But then he brought the boys out. He said... These are people who are willing to die for a nation. And this is, and, and he, he branded them the Khalsa. Khalsa means a, a person who is celebrate, who does not make any compromise, is willing to die. Either they're going to be victorious or they're going to die. Well, that is exactly what a Chatriya is in the Vedic tr tradition. They, there's no such thing as dying with a wound in your back. You, you can never turn your back to the enemy. You have to fight. Either you win or you lose. So such bravery is necessary in order uh, to uh, manage a kingdom. And, and the, the king has to be the number one. In fact, previously, the kings would lead the army. They, didn't, they wouldn't stay back in a protected place. They would be fighting also with the army. And they would lead them into battle. So this was, you know, the uh, the real, uh, let's say, culture of the Chatriyas. Okay, so are there any questions about this verse or purport? Uh, well, how do you spell the second one? I think that's him. It's a vigraha. So in Sanskrit, Oh, did you say para vigraha? Pa para upakar. Yeah. And then para upakar. Are they the same? Well, what what do you understand of the second one? What it was it So what what I heard somewhere is that para upakar is doing good to others. Yeah. Whereas the para upakar is actually serving the Lord. Is that? I don't know. I know what the first one is. I'm not sure about no, the no, second. No, no. Parokar is a single word. It's yeah, so word. Sandhi. You split in the Sandhi. Yeah, it's a vigraha of the. In Sanskrit, we, we cannot read the whole word, so we split it. Even if you see in the Bhagavad So you're saying that it's the same thing. It's the same word. Yeah. Okay. Parokar is same Sanskrit word. There's the answer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a parakupakar. You combine it with parokar. Yeah, yeah. Like parokar. Yeah. Well, the uh, devotee is always dedicated to doing good to others. And the highest good is to teach them and train them to be Krishna conscious. Maybe I think another word that I also get confused is paradharma and parodharma. Are they same? I, think, I don't know. I didn't find the parodharma, but uh, parokar I know. No, parodharma is the same. Same? Yeah. Because the, the Lord says, swadharma nidhanam shreya paradharma bhayavaha. There, he says, like, you know, doing your duty is, is right, but doing the para, paradharma is not, you know, particularly at the bodily level. Whereas we also have parodharma, which is supposed to be the supreme duty. Am I getting confused? 
Well, I'm not an expert in Sanskrit or Sanskrit pronunciation, so uh, it's better. Sabipum so paru dharmo. There's a verse in the Bhagavatam. Yeah, it's in the second chapter, yeah. yeah. Sabaipum sa paro dharma. Paro dharma. Yato bhakti ra hoksate. Paro dharma is not the name of Sanatana. Paro dharma is the highest dharma. Mm. Bhakti. Pure so devotion. Service to the doksha. It refers to his plan. Yeah. So there are two syllables, like er and u. Mm. So the er plus u becomes o. So that's how we start. And if you have a Bengali that's reading Sanskrit, He'll, tra he'll, he'll read it differently than uh, a South Indian Brahmin who's reading Sanskrit, you know, or, or reciting Sanskrit. The Bengalis always put O oh after everything, you know. Right. Hali bolo. Well, so <laughs> okay. They don't have words, so they're both. There's a both. Yeah. Right. So Virat, if you say Virat. Virato. Virat, there's a Virat. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the word, they can't pronounce words. So here's this verse. Savai Pumsa Paro Dharma Yato Bhakti Rahoksuja Haitaki Pratyata Yat Master Prasiddhati. This is uh, first canto, second chapter, verse number six. And it says Paro Dharmo. This is Sanskrit, right? Mm. Paro. So Paro Dharmo, but because of euphemism, where uh, certain uh, when when you have a uh, two vowels. Uh, uh, well, no, we have a. V anyway, because of the principle of euphemism, the actual word is para dharma, but it's pronounced for euphemistic purpose. Euphemistic means sounds better, right? More, more poetic. In the verse, it's paro dharma. Okay, although the word, it, the words are para dharma. So, Maharaj then. 335 in Bhagavad Gita. I, I see some, at least in my mind, there's some conflict in terms of where the Lord says, Swadharma Nidhanam Shreya Paradharma Bhayobhava. So there, Paradharma is described as the duties prescribed for others. Are you talking about Swadharma? Swadharma and then Paradharma in 335. Okay, but see, that is because. Uh, okay, so when you have, so you're 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 saying why is it para dharmat instead of swa dharmo, right? Is yeah. That, here, this there in the Bhagavatam where you said paro dharmo is the highest duty, but here the Lord is saying swadharma is important, not paradharma is actually not, not good for you. So obviously they are probably referring to two different things. So it says, far better to discharge one's prescribed duties, even though faultily, than another's duties perfectly. Okay, so you not you have to read the, the translation to understand what, what's being said. In other words, he's saying, paradharma is uh, do higher duties, right? But if you are a sudra by quality and work, but you decide you want to be a brahmana, but without the quality and just do the work, that's a mistake. Okay, that's, that's the idea. You cannot artificially take the cloth of a, a brahmana and still be a, still act like a sudra. So paradharma means your prescribed duty. And swadharma means, you know, you, what is your natural duty according to your qualities. But what it's saying here is that you can, you, sh you should never want to artificially be something that you don't have the quality of. That's the point. Mm -hmm. So the word is, the two, the both, both words mean the same thing, swadharma and paradharma. But the idea, the idea of swadharma is, it's your natural way of acting. And, and paradharma is the, the highest principle of, 
or, or the, the principle of pure uh, action. So there's a difference between what you, what you inherit because of your previous karma, and therefore you have the, the qualities of a sudra, and what is uh, the, the highest standard of devotional service. So for someone who has the natural qualities of a sudra, they shouldn't try and become a, uh, a, 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 assume the position of a brahmana. They should act in their position and they will attain perfection but acting in their natural tendency. So that's why, I mean, the, the, to one, the swadharma is what you're naturally attracted to as far as qualities go. And paradharma is the highest principle of dharma. Right. So therefore the translation is it's a shreyan, it's far better, swadharma, one's prescribed duties according to your nature. Uh, Vigunat, even if it's faulty. And paradharma, then duties mentioned for others, like brahmanas, su anustitat, perfectly done. So it's better you stay in your position and, and, uh, and function with your natural, let's say, qualities, uh, even though it's not perfect, right, than to try and assume the position of a much higher uh, level of qualification, even if you could do it perfectly. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's stated, okay, so then in the, in the literal translation, it is far better to discharge one's prescribed duties, even though faultily, than another's duties perfectly. Destruction in the course of performing one's own duty is better than engaging in another's duties, for to follow another's path is dangerous. All right? So the sudra has to always be humble and, uh, and offer service to others. So it's better that he remains in that position, even if he could be, even if he could act act, not necessarily be, but act perfectly as a brahmana, you know, uh, because he would get puffed up unnecessarily. He would assume that position without the right uh, qual qualification for it. So we see that. We see that all the time. We see that someone becomes a great leader, but they don't have the qualities of a great leader. So they, they might do their job pretty well, but eventually it will be a failure for them. It is better they just stay in their position, that their natural position, and follow uh, the rules, even if they don't follow them perfectly, because they'll make more, what, because ultimately, the problem with everyone is the false ego. So if you get a high position, and just like the uh, fox, he fell in a, uh, a vat of, of uh, blue color, so he became a blue-colored fox, and he walked around the, the forest, and, and he was accepted as the king of the animals because they had never seen anything like that. And, and they all worshipped him and everything, and then one day uh, there was a full moon and there was a, a troop of foxes in the forest, and they started howling, Hoo! like that. And the fox heard them, and his na nature came back, and he started howling like the fox. Then the animals realized this guy, this guy's not a king, he's just an ordinary fox, and they chased him away. <laughs> so it's better you just stay in your position and function according to your uh, dharma, and then, uh, and then make spiritual advancement gradually, and, but not try and artificially assume a position, even if you could do it not, not artificially assume it, because you'll fall down eventually. That's, that's what they're trying to say. The swadharma is what you're naturally, uh, let's say, your natural Ability. quality. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. natural. Is, and, here in, in this, summary, yeah. in this context, proper, I, I think proper explains also in the purport. Yeah. In, in about, about exactly, if you can, could hear. In this statement, Sri Sutta Goswami answers the first question of the sages in Naima Saranya. The sages asked him to summarize the whole range of revealed scriptures and present the most essential part. Oh, no, Maharaj, you were talking about Bhagavad Gita, no? 
Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Okay, it's 335, is that it? And because it's, it's, uh, it's One should therefore discharge his prescribed duties in full Krishna consciousness rather than those prescribed for others. Materially, prescribed duties are duties enjoined according to one's psychophysical condition under the spell of the modes of material nature. Spiritual duties are as ordered by the spiritual master for the transcendental service of Krishna. But whether material or spiritual, one should stick to his prescribed duties even up to death rather than imitate another's prescribed duties. Duties on the spiritual platform and duties on the material platform may be different, but the principle of following the authorized direction is always good for the performer. Okay. When one is under the spell of the modes of material nature, one should follow the prescribed duties for his particular situation uh -huh. and should not imitate others. So, therefore, I'll give you an example. After Prabhupada's disappearance, he appointed certain people to be gurus, 11 people, right? And they started functioning like gurus, but they thought because they were appointed, they are on the same level as Prabhupada. So they tried to force everyone, including Prabhupada's disciples, to accept them as being the next Prabhupada. And there was one Prabhupada, now there's 11 Prabhupadas, right? And, but it didn't work. M uh, most of them, not all, but most of them fell down because they assumed a position that they were not qualified for. They could, Although they got the, the position, they should have continued acting the way they were before, accepting that they're, they, they are just a humble servant of Prabhupada, not that they've become Prabhupada. Right? See, so that's my understanding. Mm -hmm. So here, uh, in, in, part, in this particular verse, uh, Swadharma, Krishna speaking about Swadharma on level of Varnashram Dharma. Yeah. So according to the quality of nature, it should act accordingly. But he's not, here he's not speaking about being transcendental, but uh, uh, being of your situation as uh, uh, belonging to uh, a social order. So you to, that's what your, 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 your mode of nature you, inf you, I would say, you are. You influenced by that mode of nature, to get to act on that's what that means. Yeah. But, but in the Shrimad Bhagavatam and the Savaya Kumso Parodharma, so there is that Parodharma. That's the that highest level. That's the highest level, transcendental. Okay. See. If we assume to be something we're not and insist on acting on that level, you'll fall down, definitely. Just like the fox, he looked like the king, he acted like a king, but when he heard the, the other foxes howling, he started howling like an ordinary fox. And they, had, they threw him out. So <laughs> <laughs> Gaur Govinda Maharaj used that, a lot, that example a lot. <laughs> One time he was in my house giving a lecture. I listened in. Yeah, and uh, he had been uh, insulted by uh, two of the uh, <laughs> Prabhupads, new Prabhupads. <laughs> he gave this example, this exact example of the fox. Uh, he didn't mention any names, but everybody understood what he was talking about. <laughs> and what happened is both of those guys fell down. But Gordon yeah. Govinda Maharaj never fell down. Mm -hmm. So you cannot artificially accept a position that you don't have the qualification for. Now, but, so why did Prabhupada, why didn't he rec recognize that they were not qualified to accept that position? Well, they were the, in, in his eyes, they were the best men at that time. And it was up to them to understand how to properly execute that position. If they just artificially said, now I am Prabhupada, I'm on the same level as Prabhupada, you have to accept me like that. That was their mistake. You see, because when you're, when you're a guru, there's two tensions. On one side, your disciples are trying to tell you, oh, you are uh, an avatar. You, Krishna sent you into this world and you're making so many devotees, you are an avatar. On the other side, 
he's supposed to act like an idiot in front of his guru. Mm -hmm. So which side do you think he's going to be attracted to? He's going to, he's going to naturally vacillate toward the disciples who are treating him like avatar of Krishna rather than the other side where he's supposed Being, to. Mm -hmm. So you have to maintain the proper understanding. If, if you go too far to this side, you're going to fall down. You can't maintain that position if you don't you have lose, it. You lose the balance. Yes. So that tension is there always, right? But most, not, not most, but a lot of people just go toward the other side where they actually think they are avatar. Because you know? attractive. <laughs> <laughs> but Maharaj is quick. Look, now, Krishna telling Arjuna not to do the, the highly prescribed duty, Parodharma, right? He just told him acting, Swadharma. But then yet, at the end, Krishna instructs Arjuna to act even in the, in the topmost level, Sabha Dharma Parijaja. That's even, that's like, that's the, the What do you mean by the top level? To surrender to Krishna completely, that's the top Dharma, that's the supreme Dharma. Yes, but see, well, well, wait a minute, that doesn't mean you become Krishna. No, 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 no. We're talking about uh, executing Swadharma and Paru Dharma, right? We, we're discussing about that, right? So now, Sarva Dharma and Parichaja, that's even higher than being a sannyasi, in, like, I mean, the top level. So now, one, one hand. No, it's just like this. Like, mm -hmm. Prabhupada is Mahabhagavat. But he purposely came down to the level of Madhyama Adhikari in order to preach. Mm -hmm. Because Mahabhagavat sees everybody as a devotee. But the Madhyam Adhikar, who's a preacher, he sees four categories. He sees Krishna, he sees devotees, he sees people who are ignorant or innocent, and he sees demons. Envious. So he, he has to he has to he, he has to see those four things in order to function as a leader and a teacher. But the pure devotee, he sees everybody as Krishna's uh, as devotee. So it's more, it's, you cannot function as a leader by being an Uttama Adhikari. Like for example, uh, uh, Rishabhadev was, func was, was, was uh, living uh, in uh, the completely renounced, right? He's an Avadut. He didn't make any effort at all to protect himself or any effort to maintain himself, right? And he didn't get angry at anyone. People were urinating on him, throwing rocks at him, treating him like dirt because they thought he was crazy. So he didn't fight back at all. He accepted any situation. If no one gave him something to eat, he wouldn't eat. Right? That's Avadut uh, yoga. So uh, you can't be a leader of society, uh, you know, in other words, before that, he was leader of society. But when he took that avadut yoga, uh, he uh, considered everyone as, as uh, a pure devotee and himself as fallen. And he never uh, protested. So you can't, and, and Prabhupada said, in order to preach, he has to, you have to, even if you're a Uttama Adhikari, you have to come down to the level of Madhyama and see these four categories in order to function yeah. Uh, Maharaj is uh, very tricky here, really, because here we have Krishna <laughs> telling Arjuna to do Swadharma, to do whatever he's capable to do, as he can, according to his quality. nature, quality, yeah. uh, natural. And then on the other hand, it's called Parodharma. It's very tricky in the sense that actually Swadharma, in, one, in this sense, means that the uh, the Dharma of the soul. And what is the Dharma of the soul? Is when Krishna orders you to do, or spiritual master tells you to do, that's the real Swadharma. And that also can be even, it's better than Parudharma, actually. Actually, you're, you're right in the sense that Arjuna was trained to be a Kshatriya. Right. But he, now he wanted to become nonviolent. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. And Krishna refused it because that desire was illicit. Correct. He said, you just stick to your dharma. You're, you've been trained to be a Kshatriya, 
But now you have to fight without any personal desire, simply to please Krishna. Correct. That is, that's part of Dharma. Yeah. yeah. That's what you're saying. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's very tricky. <laughs> Yeah, because when you, when you analyze it, it's like we said that anything done for Krishna, that, that's from our we said he's no, he's no griyasta, he's no vanasprasta, he's no sannyasi, he's no this and that and that and that. So here in case Arjuna of wanted to serve his family, right, right, instead exactly. of serving Krishna, yes, right. So there, that was that was rejected. And Krishna thought, oh, I don't accept that. That was because Arjuna is his friend. Mm. And it's his devotee, so he stepped in and corrected him as a guru. And Arjuna accepted Krishna as guru, so that's the guru's function, is to correct those misconceptions. But see, he's, t he's telling Arjuna, do your swadharma according to my instruction. Right. So that's part of dharma. Yeah. He didn't say it directly, but it, it, when you say it, in, really, to Krishna, in the way he speaks sometimes, you know, he had to be very, very attentive to understand, you know. He said, do your dharma. In, in, in other words, Krishna asked him to do that, whether so good or bad. Karma yoga becomes bhakti yoga when you want to please Krishna by doing your duty. And karma yoga, when you have a personal uh, motive for doing your duty, that's not considered pure. It's, it's, okay, it's good, but it's not considered pure. It's a karma yoga. Yeah. So I'll give you another example, and this is a very subtle one. That is, there was a discussion between Bhakti Srub Damodar and Prabhupada about uh, the body having uh, so many cells, and each cell is an individual. So Bhakti Srub Damodar kept saying, "Well, uh, there, there's, uh, you know, I, I'm the I'm the most important cell in the in the body, and uh, and they." Uh, they should be working to cooperate with me. And Prabhupada said, no. No. He said, you're, you're no better than they are. And he said, what? I, he, he couldn't understand that, right? Prabhupada said, you're making, you're accepting the effect as the cause. Mm. Wow. Uh, what does that mean exactly, right? It means that every cell living in your body or my body is an individual and they're living in their natural habitat like for example in your stool and my stool there are germs those germs don't have to listen to what you or I say they're individual they're individuals and they're living in their natural habitat mm -hmm. your stool mm -hmm. my stool right and the same way all these other cells, they're living in their natural habitat. Yeah. They, they're not obliged to listen to what we say or follow our orders or cooperate with us. They, they, they're, living, they're, they're just living in a natural habitat. And so when you die, uh, all the chemistry is still there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then living things come out of the dead body. Maggots, germs, and other things. See, because that's their natural habitat. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we are the king and they are, they are our servants. Even though we say my body. But actually, no. It's Krishna's. Actually, everything belongs to Krishna. Prabhupada said, we actually, we are, we are, how to say, we are renting this body. It's, it's not ours. Yeah, we're temporarily in the we, body. We, like a rent, you know. Uh, it belongs to Krishna. Yeah, just like you rent a house that's fully furnished. Yeah. So everything in the house belongs to the owner. It doesn't belong to you. You can use it for some time mm -hmm. as long as you pay the rent, but you don't own it. In the same way, all these cells that are individuals in our body, we don't own them. And they belong to Krishna. They all belong to Krishna. Just like I, uh, my cell also belongs to Krishna. Right? Correct. Now, if I, my cell leaves the body, the other cells are still there. The whole chemistry is still there, mm -hmm. right? And then living things come out of that uh, uh, body because the chemistry is still there. Mm. And there's still living beings in it. Yeah. So Prabhupada said, you, you're taking the effect to be the cause. The ultimate cause of everything is Krishna. It's not the cells or you mm. or me. The ultimate cause is Krishna. The ultimate proprietor is Krishna. So. Yes.
question to come back? Okay. Yeah. So, is it applicable to devotees and non devotees if this statement is valid for both? Yes. Even though someone is very good devotee, still No, you see, the, don't, don't get confused by the word nature. Someone says, well, my nature is to eat meat. Everybody in my family eats meat. But is, that's, that's not your real nature. Your real nature is to eat only prasadam, right? So you have to, don't, don't misunderstand the word nature. The nature is we are all subordinate to Krishna. He's the Supreme Personality God. We are his servants. That's the real nature. It's not that, well, in my family we drink wine and we eat meat and we eat chicken every Sunday. That's not your real nature. People would naturally go to that understanding when you use the word nature, you know, but that, mm -hmm. that's not a fact. Actually, there's a, uh, in this, um, this context, in Jaiva Dharma, this has been discussed. Okay. About Nitya, like Nitya Dharma, and this and that, Swadharma and Nitya Dharma also. It's beautiful. Bhakti um, Thakur, Jeva Dharma. Yeah, uh, like in the question, question, uh, question and answers, beautiful. 